All right, guys, welcome to Beauty of Darkness Book Reviews. Uh, we have a really special guest here today. I've really been anticipating this one. And from the chat, looks like you guys have been too. I don't know if I've had so many like free live uh, chats. Uh, I apologize about this not going 100% with the green screen yet, but your boy will get it down. All right. Um, yeah, you got this, Matt. <laughs> but John Morrow, that is the special guest of the day. How are you, buddy? Doing great. How are you? I'm real. I'm doing really well. Uh, during during the day like this, the babysitter crapped out us today, so my wife is oh, no. totally to thank for for us being right here. So I, yeah, you know, I hope she's watching so she not, he, she hears me say that, right? Yes, yes. Please pass along my warm wishes to her. And yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I sit, where are you at right now? I am in my office. So I uh, <laughs> finished up some other meetings and uh, got back to my office here at Penn State. So I'm in the Material Science and Engineering Building. We are in this uh, beautiful University Park campus. Um, it has won all kinds of awards for all the great trees and natural beauty here. And it's just an awesome community here at Penn State. And uh, yeah, I get to be a part of it. Nittany Lions, right? That's right. All yeah. right. I, now, see, I'm always going to be a fan of yours, but we like the diff. I'm a huge fan of um, Penn State. Don't get me wrong. Big Ten, right? Yes, Big Ten. Yeah, we just uh, I'm had a Michigan blowout Wolverines. win over Iowa uh, this yeah. past weekend. Yeah. Yes, but I, I'm a Michigan fan. My mom and dad have right. been hey, northern we can Michigan still be friends, right? Yeah, I figured yeah. that you would be like, "Oh man, this guy." So, common enemy, Ohio State. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I'll tell you what: when it comes to uh, Michigan or Ohio State having a really, really good game, whether we win or lose, Penn State's that team. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a great division. I mean, Big Ten East is just so many great schools, um, you know, great football teams, of course, but also just outstanding universities. The Big Ten is really just uh, uh, the SEC is good. Great. Yeah. Uh, but really, the Big Ten, I, I started watching football in like 93, mm -hmm. uh, like three or four years old. Yeah. And I, I can't remember a time where the Big Ten wasn't just a powerhouse. Yeah, yeah. And it's about to get even more so, too. We've got uh, USC is joining, UCLA wow. is joining, um, oh. Oregon and Washington, I think, were the most recent ones. So we, we've got, you know, a bunch of the Pac-12 schools joining Big Ten starting next year. And of course, that's the year when the college football um, playoffs expands to 12 teams, too. So I, I think, you know, college football is a lot to get is about to get even uh, more interesting than it is now starting next year. Are you in a college or I know you like both, but are, are you more so a college football lover or an NFL? Oh, wow. It's hard to pick. Okay. <laughs> I love them both. So um, that's a great I guess, um, you know, since coming here to Penn State, my love for college football has, has really taken off. And, you know, it takes over the town here in, in state. Oh, college I'm sure. So we're, we're right in the middle of Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, it's, it's not that big of a town, but when we have a, a home football game, um, there's over 100,000 people who come into this town. And so we become the third largest city in Pennsylvania on those weekends. I've seen that many people one time in my life, and it was at the big house in Ann Arbor. And yes. it was a Michigan-Ohio State game. Now, I believe they have the, as far as the seats, Michigan mm -hmm. has the big, biggest um, that, the number of people, like 107,501, yeah, 801. I think, I think it's even a little bit larger than that because, yeah, the big house in Michigan is the largest stadium in the United States. Um, our stadium here at Penn State is called Beaver Stadium, and it's mm -hmm. the second largest. It's okay, just a little man. bit smaller than Michigan. So and you would had, know that fact. Yeah, so we had an attendance above 110,000 um at this weekend's game this past weekend against iowa and you know yours in michigan is a little bit larger than that so i think but, you can get up to like under twelve thousand or something yeah it was amazing like uh elbow to elbow and you know it was a michigan ohio state game of course it was uh, me and my sister i think we had just graduated high school and somebody was selling the tickets at the, the pizza shop where we worked mm -hmm. for 75 bucks a piece and he's like look i have to sell these i don't want to uh, but I have to get my a little bit of money on it. Will you pay seventy five dollars each, and you have to take off now? So that's what we yeah. did. We we drove overnight and like mm -hmm. ended up where the uh, tailgating. Uh, it's just it's fun. Oh, the College tailgating! Is like, it's like a whole city of itself that just it kind of 
blossoms the day before the game. It, it's uh, yeah, here it's called Nittanyville after after the Nittany Lions. <laughs> it's, it's a whole yes. city tailgating. <laughs> and the people, hey, you can just tell the fans are the heart of college football. It's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel so bad because there's so many. Um, chat. I'm going to get to some chats real quick. Uh, H.C. Newell was here waiting at 1.35, oh, guys. Yes, I'm her biggest fan. <laughs> and I think th that that's a mutual thing. <laughs> She's awesome. She is doing uh, amazing things with her uh, series. Um, you know, the first book was already awesome. Um, she took it up another notch with the second book. Uh, we got to do the cover reveal for her for book three. Um, which looks like the the best one yet, and it's pretty um, awesome. Yeah, and Esme just reviewed book three for Before We Go blog, and I, I'm even more excited about it now. So I know that's going to be coming in my mailbox soon, and I'm going to all right. And well, on that one. I haven't started the series yet. Uh, when I I know HD Newell had sent me like an ebook um, of the first, and I just haven't gotten to it yet, but. My last interview was with uh, Joshua Scott Edward, mm -hmm. and he is reading it on the first book. He loves it. He couldn't say yeah. enough good things. In fact, the question I asked him was, uh, who's your favorite indie author? And his answer was, well, right now it's H.C. Newell. Yeah. So yeah. that's awesome. Congratulations. Got, um, just great, really great, compelling characters, awesome dialogue. Her world building is outstanding. And she's the type of author that doesn't just, you know, construct this big world and, and then confine you to one part of it. She's, you know, taken us off to each part of the land, you know, that is so important. Books and then going across different books too. And that's something that I love is, is when, um, you know, we get this great fantasy world and we actually get to, to spend time in all the, the different parts of it. So she's, she's absolutely nailing it. That's great. Wow. I am I can imagine being her right now. That, those are some wonderful things that you just said. And I, and, and I think that's very important, the whole world building thing, where uh, you feel like, man, I open the book and I see this wonderful map. And um, I just hope that I get to see more than a tiny specific area. Right, right. Um, nice. Sometimes I don't read these chats before I put them up, but John A. Douglas is always here. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Hey, John. Great to Top see in. you. Hope yes. they're treating you well in the, the Twitter jail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he did a little, like, a live last night. Um, like, sentenced me. Oh, something along yeah. this I line. to go to that one. <laughs> it was pretty funny for the little bit that I got to go in and, and talk a little bit. And, and wow, great. what a great yeah. bunch of guys those are, too, that do the, the Iron Age really uh, push yeah. the Iron Age uh, movement. It's really yeah. good, guys. Yeah, and he's got his book coming out soon, too. Right? Yeah, The Black Crown. Yep. Yeah. Um, when is it? A few weeks the Black Crown. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, he'll have to let... I don't know if he's gotten a, a, a date yet. If if so, let us know. I can't see the most common. Wow, there's mm -hmm. so many... Ch Holy moly, you are a popular, popular guy, John. Uh, let's get to some more of these. Okay. John, what are you doing? I didn't... Oh, that was a... Sorry. <laughs> Like I said, sometimes I, I put them up and don't read them. So <laughs> let me scan for a second. Timothy Wolf's in here. He said hello. Hey, Timothy. Tuesday. Thanks for coming. Esme's in here. Esme. <laughs> John, the man, <laughs> the legend. Her reviews are just like the standard for awesome reviews. She goes into... Um, you know, so much detail about all aspects of the book and she's got so much passion for it. I just, I love anytime Esme's got a new review, it's like, okay, I have to drop whatever I'm doing and, um, you know, check out her review. And I found that we, the two of us, we've got pretty similar tastes too. So like if she finds something that she loves, it's like, okay, that just yeah. moved to the top of my TBR. So Esme, this is how I'm I'm forming my relationship with Esme. Uh, it was great. It's wonderful. It's so natural because um, you naturally sometimes you're not familiar with somebody, and then they are a repeat in viewing your lives. And then I, I keep saying seeing this name, and yeah. then I become part of fan fiatic, mm -hmm. um, and I'm seeing her name more. And, and and now I know who she is, and, and I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. And, Wow. Yeah. What a wonderful person. She is so supportive as far as this community. Uh, it's part of what I like to say, a breath of fresh air. Uh, mm -hmm. There's so many to to list. Uh, but Esme, you are one. Thank you. Absolutely. Tori Talks is in here. Hey, Tori. John. Hey, Tori. One of my favorite humans. 
<laughs> the feeling is mutual there. <laughs> All right. And uh, Matt's fantasy books. Matt, hey, Matt. Um, John, I have a very important question from one fantasy period to the next. Which team are you uh, most worried about facing your Eagles? This okay. Oh, here Great. we go. Matt, uh, first of all, thanks for coming, Matt. Yes, um, thank you, Matt. Also a huge fan of Matt's, Matt's reviews as How well. How could you not be? Um, the guy's on a schedule. I've never even yeah. thought possible. How, do, how does he do it all? I, I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I am most worried. So I want to say the Cowboys. Um, so the Cowboys are very impressive this year. And, you know, one of our uh, Penn State Nittany lines is, is there, Micah Parsons, who's absolutely tearing it up on the defense side. And I, I'm so proud of him. But at the same time, I want him to back off maybe a little little bit when he's playing the Eagles. Um, so I was pretty surprised by their game over the weekend to losing to the Cardinals. I'm not really sure what happened there. Um, I mean, they've got the Cowboys are an outstanding team. And of course, NFC East, same division as the Eagles. So that's that's the one that I'm most concerned about at this point. And then, of course, you know, getting down the line, there's always the, the Kansas City Chiefs that we have to, <laughs> have to <Yeah>. do. <laughs> this, look, I love when I interview somebody uh, that I can tell you have an analytical mind. And, and I'm oh, naturally, I mean, look where you're at. But uh, I, I love to hear it because my brain works not half as fast as yours. But I still have somewhat of an – when I read books or if I'm trying to categorize, whether it's college football or um, drawing, which I can't do, by the way, but I still like to do it. Um, it, it I like to speak to like-minded people, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, yeah. And well, it's great talking with people who have a diverse range of interests to Ooh. that. That That's it's, good. You know, it's not just like like your job and, and what you do for your job, but all these other interest areas, whether it's books or sports or, or cooking or um, I just I love to to, um, you know, talk to people because I, I can learn so much, too. I mean, everybody's coming and bringing their own experiences, their own interests. And there's just so much we can learn from each other. It, it, you are so right. Oh, my gosh. That, that's if there's one thing I would say that I do these for is that like if you can't learn and, and open your mind and say that I don't know everything and uh, I haven't experienced even 1% of what can be experienced, yeah. but by talking to other people and um, experience in other cultures and, and I don't even mean different countries, but that's really fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, and even and you, even, exactly. Even within the U S here and, you know, especially nowadays, there's so many forces trying to create division and, you know, mm -hmm. if we just, you know, have, nice dialogues um and you know we we learn so much from each other and it's just just simple things like that that can make help you know hopefully make the world a, a nicer place to be in right absolutely um yeah. hc news says i have a character named morrow in my third book <laughs> how cool is that did you know that <laughs> um wow i'm really touched hc thank you did, did you know that john so I think she reached out to me about this a little while ago. I didn't know the what exactly was going on. Mm -hmm. This is in the third book. Oh, wow. Okay. I got That's it. cool, man. Yeah. Matt also says, John, gun to your head. What's the best book you've read so far in 2023? This is not an easy question. Oh, wow. Um, there have been several. Um, so I would say on the fantasy side, um, so I really love Mark Lawrence's book, the, the book that wouldn't burn. Um, that was something that was totally unique and he has such a beautiful prose style and the way that he melds fantasy and science fiction was just, he just, he nailed it there. Um, Anna Smith Spark came out with two new books this year and they were both not just five-star books, but like really strong five-star, like shout from the rooftops types types of, of books for me. Um, A Woman of, of the Sword was her first one and um, Sword of Bronze and Ash is the second one. And both of these books deal with um, the subject of motherhood and kind of the, the struggles of motherhood within a fantasy setting. And she's taken two different approaches to it, but in both cases, um, the, the psychology of the characters that she builds in and, and just the beauty of her prose too. Um, so those two, um, Philip Chase's trilogy, the Edan trilogy. So I, I just finished that up. Um, my review is on Grim Dark Magazine for the third one, Return to Edan, and that is, it's like an instant classic that that trilogy it's it's like immediately classic at the same time it's modern and i 
you know, I love the, the type of book that combines all the great characters in action with great psychological analysis, and he nailed it there. Um, what else? On the science fiction front, I'd say my favorite is called The 10% Thief. That is by uh, uh, Lakshmi, um, uh, oh, I forgot how to, how to say her last name, but she's amazing. If you look up The 10% Thief, it's like a... Um, uh, a near future uh, Bangalore where there's kind of this uh, te technocratic society that um, compartmentalizes people and has like a new caste system. And, and she, this was her debut model and um, it was so good. Um, what else? Uh, for horror, I'd say uh, Catriona Ward's new book, Looking Glass Ooh. Sound. That wow, is, you have a broad range, and I'm so glad like, you're naming all these. <laughs> uh, so her book, it's just, it's a literary horror. And it's the type of book that sort of, it pulls you in and then sort of twists you all around. And it it becomes difficult to figure out like what is reality and what's not reality. And, and she just, she nailed it there. Um, I've, I've got, you know, other recommendations too, but those are just some of my favorites. There's so many. <laughs> Sorry, I, I escaped for a second. Um, this is the one that I picked up from her first. It's probably really hard to see because- Oh, I, I have not read that one yet. Did um, you read the last uh, I've started it and, and what you're saying about, what is the book that you said you've read up, you've read about her? Looking Glass Sound is her newest one that came out this Looking, year. I have to write that down. Sorry. Yeah, so it starts out, um, I'm not going to give like super details, but the prose is is just, I've never read a book in, in which the dialogue is that of a, a horror feeling. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't really know how to explain it. Um, maybe once I'm more versed in uh, this, what we're doing here, I'll be able yeah. to explain the, the dialogue and um, her prose a little bit better, but it starts so much. like So what, when I first started it, I just started my YouTube channel. So you mm -hmm. can see how quickly uh, my indie reads mm -hmm. have taken its spot. So yeah. uh, when I go back to doing some traditional published books, high on my list. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of which, so the book I just finished yesterday, L.L. Uh, L. McRae's book, um, The Shadow Gate. Uh, so this is book two of her indie fantasy trilogy on dragon spirits. And she, she just absolutely nailed that one. It, it's so good. Oh, um, man. Yeah, I, <laughs> my review hasn't come out quite yet, but it'll be in Grimdark Magazine in a few days. But she well, she took everything I loved about book one and just made it even better. That's so fun to hear, too, because um, niching down, I, I think, is uh, something where you find what you truly are going to love. If you yeah. start being more critical about your process of choosing what mm -hmm. uh, you're going to review rather than just saying, oh, yeah. Um, I'm just going to review as many fantasy indie book indie fantasy books as I can. The subgenres are so unique. Oh, um, there's so many. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think once you find that uh, subgenre that that really suits you as a person, mm -hmm. you're just you're you're reading for pleasure is going to be so much uh, higher. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I've also joined um, before we go blogs team for SPFBO as one of the judges this year for the self published fantasy blog. Mm -hmm. And that has been so much fun, just you know, going through this, these very diverse types of, of books that have been submitted and um, so many different styles and approaches. And, um, you know, I've even even if they were ultimately cut, there's still so many things that I loved about each one of them. Well, I'm sure that's hard to do because uh, all these most of these authors, I can't say for all 300, but uh, everybody that I've talked to uh, for the most part is they're just great people. Yeah. Uh, they're doing this out of the love that they have for literature and, and their passions. Yeah. Um, the yeah. Garden Gnome says the man yes. is a legend. Hey. Uh, I, I have to find some people have different names for their YouTube um, mm -hmm. handle or whatever. And if if it's you and I know you, but I don't recognize your, your handle, I'm very sorry. I, <laughs> I would love to have you send me a DM and be like, hey, that was me. Um, so I can call you out, not call you out, but, but shout you out, especially if you're an author. Um, let's see here real quick. Well, we'll get to a question. One of, one of my questions, how did you get into blogging with, uh, Grimdark magazine and before we go blog? Oh, wow. Um, so I need to give, um, 
uh, I'd say most of the credit uh, for this goes to my daughter, actually. So she, wow. um, so you know, she has a lifelong love of learning. Um, you know, we've read books together ever, ever since she was little. And, you know, I'd been on Goodreads for a long time. I'd been on Goodreads for like eight years or so, basically just as a means to keep track of my books. So I don't like forget about what I have. Yeah, exactly. Like, just put some star ratings, but I never wrote any reviews. And at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, obviously there's a lot more time to, to read when everyone's in quarantine. Um, so I introduced her to Goodreads, just, you know, thinking that she would use it the same way I had been using it. Um, just so, you know, keeping track of, of her books and, you know, she had lots of bookshelves uh, full of great, uh, especially young adult um, fantasy books at that point. And, um, you know, she went beyond anything I had done there. She had found a community. Uh, she started writing reviews. And, you know, before I knew it, she was like climbing the ranks of the top reviewers in the United States. And she actually peaked at being the number three reviewer in the United States. Um, wow. Well, we were like, you know. Proud dad moment. A very proud dad moment. She's awesome. So she, she's been my inspiration for this. And um, and I got to the point of, of kind of getting back into more fantasy stuff. And there was one trilogy I read I just felt so passionate about I couldn't keep it to myself. And that was Mark Lawrence's Book of the Ancestor. And I got to the end of book three, Holy Sister. And I just, I felt like, I felt all the feelings. It's like all these good things that I hadn't felt about a book in, in a while. And I was just like, I can't contain myself. And so I posted kind of a, a short review on Goodreads and she, my daughter found it. She's like, what is this a review? And, yeah. and um, anyway, I just, I felt like I, I needed to have an outlet where I could share my love of these books. And so, you know, inspired by what my daughter was doing, I kind of uh, would write more, more Goodreads reviews. They became better. They became longer. Oh, oh thanks Lord. Um, and then, um, and then I saw, uh, there's a posting uh, on Twitter from Adrian Collins, um, who's the editor in chief and founder of Grimdark Magazine. He's like, "Hey, I, I'm looking for new reviewers, and I've been reading Grimdark Magazine for quite a while. I, they were like one of my primary sources for trying to find great new books, and um, you know, I'd, I'd read them several times a week. So I was like, "Hey." why not? Yeah. <laughs> so I just, I sent him an email and, and uh, gave him a, a link to uh, some of my reviews. The, the newest one I had done was uh, Mark Lawrence's, um, the final book of his uh, Book of the Ice trilogy. So The Girl on the Moon. And I just, I went all out on that review because this was one book that combined like things from all of his trilogies at that point. And uh, yeah, they, they liked what they saw and invited me to join. And actually the very first review, it's so fitting that you've got L.L. McRae on, on here right now because the first review that I wrote for Grimdark Magazine was The Iron Crown. So Lauren, Lauren McRae's um, first book of her Dragon Spirits trilogy, which was an SPFBO finalist um, back two times ago. And that was the first one that I, I reviewed for Grimdark Magazine. Wow. And, um, and so it was so cool returning to book two just now and, uh, you know, thinking about everything that's happened over the past year and a half since I joined the team there. Um, and of course, one of the the leads on Grimdark Magazine is Beth Tabler. Beth is, is awesome in so many ways. And in addition to all the great stuff she does for Grimdark Magazine, she has her, her own site before we go blog, which is it's broader in scope. So it's not just focused on on dark and grimdark stuff, but uh, fantasy, sci-fi, horror in general. Um, she's also got her team for SPFBO. And so she invited me to join um, that team as well. And um, which is great because my interests are broader as well. And so now if I'm, uh, if I want to review a book that may not be appropriate or, you know, within the scope for Grimdark Magazine, I can sure. do it at Before We Go blog and interviews or, if somebody's already done it for Grimdark Magazine, I can write a review for Before We Go blog. And they're just two awesome teams as well um, on both sides. So it, it's been great in terms of, you know, making new friends um, who, you know, share a common passion and uh, want to, um, you know, tell the world about these great new books. And um, of course, meeting the broader community too, especially, especially the indie community too, has been yeah. very welcoming.
Yeah. Wow. That was such a good answer. I, you've got your fantasy blog and, and then you've got uh, anything else. So before we go blog, do they have a constraint of genres or genres or are you pretty much able to choose any genre? It's like? pretty much any speculative fiction. So um, yeah, that's it's mostly fantasy, science fiction and horror. Um, I'd say magical realism also falls falls within there. Um, I've even I've reviewed some literary fiction too for before we go blog. And Beth um, T Beth Tabler, who runs it, she um, basically you know lets us do what we want. So if if it's something that um, you know we think we as individual contributors to the blog think will be of interest for uh, the readers, she's like go for it. So um, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Uh, I wanted to, to make sure I if I, there was a whole lot of chat if I, that I had to go through. Um, most of it, it looked like you guys talking to each other. But if I missed a question or anything, um, I'm current now. So uh, you can go ahead and re-ask that if I haven't asked your question. Yeah, yeah. Please, and please ask whatever you like. I'm, I'm a, an open book. <laughs> All right. That's great. Uh, we've got um, Matt from Go Read Books drop, hey, dropped Matt. in. Uh, we've got, channel. yes, he's right. He's doing something really cool. He is. Me and him did a, uh, it was like talk with a booktuber kind of thing. And mm -hmm. we've got something on the back burner right now. And I can't wait to talk with him again. The chemistry that you get with certain people, um, <clears throat> you just remember that. And oh, yeah, it's really yeah, fun. He, he's a great guy. He is. Uh, John A. Douglas says, Hail Go. He's a hailing guy. He likes to hail people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, E.L. Montague, just joined myself. Yeah. All right. Thank you, E.L. Montague. Thanks for joining. He, he's a frequent on my Discord. I really appreciate him dropping by. Um, <clears> H.T. <throat> says, L.L. the Queen. I think a lot of people feel that way. Uh, oh, Mr. Bo Kelly, look at this. Hey, John and Bo. Sophia, our powerhouse team when it oh, comes to you, doing. <laughs> That means so much. That was yeah, wonderful. And Sophia, actually, my, my daughter, so she also just joined Before We Go blog, so she's got several re reviews up. Um, most recently, about a week ago, we actually did uh, a review together of uh, Tori's book, Phased, which we both really loved. Um, and basically, it was back and forth discussion where um, we kind of had our, our discussion together over the, the dining room table and, and wrote it down as we were having our discussion. And... Uh, it was so much fun. It's, it's just, it's a great, you know, father daughter bonding experience when we can, you know, both read uh, a book that we both, you know, felt a real connection to and appreciate wow. and, and share what it is that we love. So this is uh, Tori Tekken's book, Phase. So definitely check it out. It's, it's a book that it's, um, you know, I'd say officially it's in a young adult fantasy genre, but don't let that young adult label fool you. Don't it, you think like that it does? A lot of people will make that well, book up. Isn't that like, um, it, I did for a very long time and now I won't make that mistake again. Yeah, there's so much there for adults to um, both enjoy, but also appreciate in terms of the, the psychological depth that she has given the characters. And you know, for Sophia and me, it gave us just a, a great um, platform to have uh, some really nice discussions. So thank you for that, Tori. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, the, you have, do you ever have moments where you're like, wow, I thought I have gotten a grasp on this whole indie writing realm. And then you hear about more and more. And oh, especially yeah. about people, it's like, I don't know anything. And I love that. But I also, I don't want that to come across like, oh, what you're doing um, wasn't on my radar because there is so much on not all of our, that's not on all of our radars that I can't wait to discover. Right, right. Well, I, one of the one of the many things I love about indie is the fact that there's no gatekeeper there. So Ooh, you know, yes. these authors, um, you know, they're passionate about their area of fantasy or whatever their genre is. And there's nobody there that is acting like the gatekeeper that's saying, no, this doesn't fit our preconceived notion of what a commercially successful book would be. Um, you know, in the case of a young adult book, right? I think there's a certain um, perceptions. Oh, thanks, Tori. Certain perceptions about what a young adult fantasy book should be. And that has been, you know, established based on um, you know, whoever have been the most commercially successful in those areas. And so that that kind of creates um, these preconceptions about what people have. And so when somebody like Tori comes in, 
um, with something that I'd argue is a lot, um, a lot deeper and a lot, you know, different approach compared to what we're used to. It's it's really a breath of fresh air, and you know the in the indie pathway is, I would say, the best, maybe the only way to do that. Mm. Um, and so it's real, really cool that we've got all these great authors who are, um, you know, publishing this way. And I think it's also uh, there's so many different people doing what they do best. I guess the best way I put it, what you're doing, uh, not many people do it as good as as you do it. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I think people who have those qualities should know that. Um, and I think you're doing a wonderful thing. I that's just that's my personal feelings and all this love you're getting is very inspiring. Oh, um, oh, John's got a question here. Yeah. John says, what was your first fantasy book? Was it the book that inspired, or what was it the book that inspired you to read further into the genre? Oh, thanks, John. So um, my first fantasy book was when I was in sixth grade. Um, and precisely. I come, from, <laughs> yeah, I come from a very small town um, we're kind of, everyone's related to everyone else. And my English teacher in sixth grade was actually um, my mom's cousin's husband. So I, I called him cousin, cousin Dennis, Dennis O'Brien. <laughs> in school, I had to call him Mr. O'Brien. Um, but, you know, to me, he was cousin Dennis. So he was one of the best English teachers that I ever had. And I'm not just saying that because he's a relative. He, um, you know, taught us so much about writing, about grammar and diagramming sentences and, and things that, um, kind of seemed to have fallen out of favor in a lot of um, English classes. But one of the, the great things he did, one of the many great things, was he assigned The Hobbit to us Ooh. in school. And we, so we read that as a class, and I just fell in love with Tolkien and with The Hobbit, and it was like a revelation for me. And I was like, is there more of this? Yeah. Uh, and my cousin Dennis is like, yes, there is more. And like, here's the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah. So I had this, um, it's the eighties copy of the mass market paperback of the Lord of the Rings that have some pretty funny covers. Of course, this precedes any of the movies. And so we didn't really have these preconceived notions about what all the characters should look like based on the movies. So anyway, the covers are kind of funny, um, but yeah, wow. they are. Yeah, <laughs> but I went. I spent my study halls going to the library, and um, you know, reading through the Lord of the Rings. And my like the spines on those books are so worn down. I, I still have that copy too. And then from there, it was the Silmarillion, which uh, of course is is more of a, a challenge from a, a reading point of view, given how dense it is. But I, I enjoyed that one too. Um, you know, back then there weren't as many choices for fantasy like we have now. I, I think there's been there's been a renaissance in, in fantasy and the indie community has been a huge part of that. Oh, yeah. um, but even with traditionally published, there's a lot more options now than there were back then. So I had, you know, from there, there was like Chronicles of Narnia, um, Chronicles of Prydain by Lloyd Alexander. Um, and oh, they're just, just so good. Um, so yeah, it, it was, it was the book that inspired me to read further in the genre. Sorry, I didn't mean to click that down. You have a great memory because you absolutely remember that. Sorry about that. Um, oh, no problem. Oh, thanks, Quinn. Thanks for the Quinn comment. came in here and said, that I want to make sure to get to his comment. Um, now yeah. another indie author, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Wonderful. I can't, I want to make sure before I, I, I've absolutely seen his name. I didn't know if you were a reviewer or an author. I'm right. I'm glad I was right. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Yael Montague, he said, I think that's a good point. Uh, beauty is born in chaos. Nature is not a recipe, but a soup. A good, that uh, a good theory. Approach. Yes. And you know, every, every fantasy book needs a good soup, right? <laughs> that is no, absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. Um, Andrew from the fool's tale. I used to say a fool's tale, the fool's tale, um, YouTube book, booktube channel. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, by the way. One of the guys that inspired me to do this, what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, damn, I wish I read The Hobbit as a kid. Still love it as a late teen, though. Well, I think me and him are in similar. I talk mm -hmm. about it a lot, but I love to talk about it, so I'm going to say it again. I have saved The Hobbit for um, when my oldest son is as young as he can possibly be, because I'm very excited. Uh, every mm -hmm. It's my wife's like, stop grabbing the book. He won't understand. He's four. 
And I'm like, yeah, but. So you can never start too soon. So with with my daughter, I, I distinctly remember when she, like before she could even talk, she was an, an infant sitting on my lap and I'd have the, the board books, um, you know, very hungry caterpillar types of books. And yeah. she'd be like chewing on the side of the book uh, you know, drool all over, all over, it. and then, but she was interested. She wanted to hear the story, and then, um, you know, if, if you start kids early, you can um, instill in them a love of reading, which is also a love of learning, which is also a love of writing, um, and it's it's one of the greatest gifts that you can give a kid. It's it's that love of reading because it connects to you know, anything that they're going to want to pursue in the future, whatever field that they want to study, whatever their job is, um, reading and those skills of reading and being, um, being you know, not only creative, but also curious about learning new things um, and self-driven and being able to communicate ideas, no matter what they do, it, it's going to be something that, that benefits them both in their career, but more importantly, in their life as a person and, and having these passions. So, um, wow. yeah, you, you, I would say you can't read, read too much. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I, I, I don't, I definitely read to the kids, but it's like what you were saying, the hungry caterpillar. Um, I'm a part of, I believe it's, what is her name? Um, she does the Tennessee, she's big in Tennessee, uh, Dolly Parton. Oh, yeah. um, she does like a kids every mm -hmm. month they send a, it's like a free thing too. like all of my kids get all the, these free yeah. books. It's like yeah. a really cool thing she's doing. Dolly um, Parton is a national treasure. She has done 100%. so many great things on so many different fronts. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, they are always down for daddy or mommy to read yeah. to them. Yeah. And it, I guess it's my yeah. overzealousness uh, yeah. to want to specifically read The Hobbit, you know, um, <laughs> But, so I probably started a little yeah. too early, but there's, I'm there's a lot of like middle grade fantasy books that you can read too. Um, so uh, yeah, we like, we went through a whole bunch of series together, but basically age appropriate series as as she grew up. But and just, start, just start with the, throw them in the deep end. Yeah, I, I, that was funny when I seen that. That's really good. Uh, you know, I'm yeah. not the kind of dad that wouldn't do that either. I might yeah. do that. I mean. <laughs> At the end of the day, I think something that you find that you don't understand, you have a natural curiosity to want to know about it. So yeah. I, I think that um, that's a good point, too. Um, D.B. Rook. All right. One of my favorite indie authors. So yeah. nice to hear Silly mentioned. Oh, so brilliant. So one of my distinct childhood memories of when I was in, I must have been, say, junior high or high school at the time, but I was staying overnight with my grand, at my grandparents' house. And, you know, it's a very old house. They didn't have any heat on the second floor where the bedroom was and it was so cold and it had all these stacks of blankets and i'm like huddled in the blankets with my silmarillion open and and oh, it's just that's a wonderful that's, nostalgia <laughs> that's yeah. uh do, do you find yourself feeling nostalgic with certain books like obviously the hobbit um yeah, but yeah. and silmarillion but any so, others books yeah i would say um there's something about just about any book and this goes the same for music too it's like when you read a book or listen to music that um, you're returning to after some time that at least for me it sort of transports me back to the first time that i had that experience either with with the book or with a song or with an album and it's really interesting because over time if it's something that you keep returning to and i'd say probably this is true more so with music than with books because you know you can be listening to music as you're doing other things that it kind of um you know accumulates all those experiences over the years and it, it strikes me too like if i'm enjoying a book or um you know some song with my daughter now that i enjoyed when i was growing up and you know thinking back 20, 30 years ago that, you know, I've got all those memories from back then and it's special because of that, but now I've got all these new memories and it's special because of that too. And it, it's like this, this superposition of, of memories over time that just makes it all the more special. Yeah. Wow. That's yes, absolutely. That's wonderful way to put that. Um, before I get to my next question that I want to throw up here, um, it kind of, lingers about what, what you do at 
Penn State. So would you tell the people a little bit more about what you do? Sure, of course. So I am a professor of material science and engineering, um, which is in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences at Penn State. Um, so material science is a field that combines um, physics and chemistry and engineering. And basically, we try to both design new materials for certain applications, as well as understand what is it about the chemistry and the structure of those materials that governs their properties. So there's there's different um, subfields within material science. There's like polymer scientists, there's metallurgists, there's uh, ceramic scientists and engineers. Um, and my subfield is glass. So I'm a glass scientist. And um, yeah, I study everything to do with glass. I've got a, a group of about what 18 or 20 students here. Um, and we, uh, we melt glasses, we invent new glasses, we do uh, fundamental studies to show how um, the chemistry and the structure of the glass relate to properties. We do uh, computer modeling and simulation of the atomic structure of glass. We derive new theories to um, explain uh, glass properties. Um, some of my students are artists too. We've got a glass blowing studio that several of my students are working on. Actually, one of my students, I've got some of the art here. Uh, one of my students, Brittany, Brittany Hockey, did this oh, for, so cool. so she's a, a double major in art and science. And this is a special type of glass. It's a, a vanadium telluride glass, which is something that can be used for um, infrared optics, like for night vision and stuff. So it's got a lot of wow. different applications. And if you look closely, it's actually crystallizing a little bit at the bottom there. I can see um, that, yes. And so she actually turned this into this beautiful work of art. Um, I got, oh, I got more art here. Another, another one of my students, Aaron. So he's from, uh, originally from University of Wisconsin. He is wow. uh, one of the students who's taking the lead on our glass studio here. And he made this beautiful uh, cobalt glass uh, plate here. Cobalt. So cobalt is what's giving it the blue co color. It almost looks like Neptune, doesn't it? When it really it. does. It's gorgeous. <laughs> wow, that's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah so, that is uh, so interesting. I've got some really talented students who, um, you know, there's something about glass too that brings together people with um, artistic talents. And so, um, you know, these students, they're, they're, they've all got different aspects of glass that they love, but a, a common love of glass that brings everyone together. And it's just a really cool group of students. And um, it's really, you know, my privilege to be able to, to work with them and, and to help them to learn and grow. Um, hey, Mark. Mark Lawrence himself popped in. Position. Yes. Hey, that thanks is wonderful. for coming, Mark. Thank you for stopping in, Mark. That's super awesome. He says, John mentions superposition and beards seeks neatly in glass science. Love it. Yes, yes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And Mark, if you didn't know this, so he is a physicist and a mathematician. So he, um, he's got his PhD. He did some uh, amazing uh, research on kind of the, the mathematical side of physics. And with his books, you can you can sort of read them at multiple levels. You can take like the surface level story and have a blast with the story, and it's great. But he's got like so many layers underneath that, and a lot of it builds off of his um, his technical background. And it, it, for me, it's it's so he he's my favorite author. Um, oh, that's so cool! Dude. <laughs> wow. And, and um, I just I love all the kind of scientific stuff that is kind of buried beneath the surface that, um, you know, for readers who want to dig into that level, um, there's doesn't so much it, to discover. Doesn't it make you want to like, I wonder what else is waiting behind those fingertips, you know, like, yeah. what else can I look forward to? And like, can he write it faster, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he's, he's very reliable. So he comes up with, um, you know, at least one new book each year. Um, he is. You know, I, I mentioned the book that wouldn't burn already as one of my favorites for the year, and he's already written the entire trilogy. But so the next book comes out next year, the next book comes out the year after that. But you don't have to worry about like an unfinished trilogy. With me. I watch he's him on TikTok, uh, and he does really funny stuff on TikTok. But he often makes the joke about how unproductive he is, and it's like, <laughs> come on, people who are fans of you know this is not true. Yeah, yeah. But and, and if you really are have been moments of unproductivity, then your moments of productivity are very productive. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> so thank you again, Mark, for stopping in here. It's yeah, fun. thanks, Mark. And the question um, that I was going to get to before asking you what you did was this one. Question for John. Have you ever read a book that had glass-based magic or some cool glass lore in it that you really liked? Oh, wow. Okay. So I mentioned the book Looking Glass Sound, um, but that really, that was about the body of water. So not really about glass itself. Um, you know, there's dragon glass that is mentioned in, in um, A Song of Ice and Fire, uh, which is just obsidian. It's a naturally occurring glass that forms from volcanic eruptions. But it's kind of cool that it got its name Dragon Glass in, uh, you know, Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, I know um, there is a relatively recent book by I think it's Brian McClellan about that that has a glass-based magic system. Um, I have not read that one yet, so uh, I'm unable to comment on that. So I know I know there's at least one that exists. Um, have I personally read one with a glass-based magic system? Um, no. I, I think my understanding is that I, I think Brian McC McClellan's approach to the glass-based magic system is kind of a uh, analogous to what Brandon Sanderson has done with allomancy and um, kind of metals and metallurgy, that he's kind of done something along those lines based on glass. Um, but I have not yet had the pleasure of reading that. Sorry about that, guys. By the way, you see me over here like having issues. My my kids like to play tricks on me and not tell me. Um, they tightened my hat so entirely much that when I put it on, I started losing brain power, <laughs> you know? Okay. So I had to fix that. Uh, that's a really cool question specifically for you, John. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Quinn. Um, HC Noah did say she had to hop off. Um, yeah, hey, thanks for joining us, HC. Yes, thank you so much. I, a writer is never unproductive. Look at him, already stabbing at me. <laughs> uh, it just looks that way because they are wandering through one of their worlds. Ooh, that's a good way to, to put that. I like that. Well, so much of it is, it's like, you know, you got to have the ideas in your head, right? About how, how you're going to approach this. And um, yeah, and a lot of the work is just, it's kind of, you know, the creative mental thinking before you can, you know, sit down and, and write. At least for me, I, I have to have um, kind of things planned out enough in my head so I've got enough structure to to writing so I can uh, uh, you know, fiber optics or glass-based magic system. Indeed, I've got a bunch of fiber optics books right behind me. So That's so <laughs> I've awesome. I've been uh, fiber optics for a while. So before I was at Penn State, I, I worked in the glass industry at Corning Incorporated. And um, my first several years there we're working on uh, fiber optics so he's exactly right um so this is the very thin strands of high purity glass that are connecting the entire world that's what enables the internet it's what's enabling us to have this conversation right now i wa i wanted that to spark something and it did yeah. it taught me something i'm always in search of knowledge and i think well i know you're the same uh and i think and what i've always been fascinated by fiber optics i don't know why uh i think it's just the the thinness um oh it's imagining amazing. touching that um, yeah yeah and in order to get that to work so the the key innovation was actually getting rid of the water because if if all you do is like dig up sand and melt it to form silica glass which is what fiber optics is um there's, it turns out there's too many impurities. So water, even just a small amount of water contamination in the fiber optics is enough to make it um, so you can't transmit signals over many miles because water absorbs at exactly the same wavelength that is used for telecommunication. So the key innovation actually came in 1970 um, at Corning, and it was a chemical process for making um, making the glass where they're reacting, it's the reacting silicon tetrachloride with oxygen in a completely dry environment. So that's what enabled like 100% purity, high, like perfectly pure glass. And that is what enabled um, fiber optics. So there's, if you go to Corning, New York, there's a great museum there called the Corning Museum of Glass and the lab oh, notebook. Know. Yes, the lab, the lab notebook where Don Stuckey, one of the inventors of optical fiber, where he recorded the first ever low loss transmission. He, he wrote there 
Whoopi, right in his lab notebook. And that's on display uh, wow. at the Cole Museum of Glass. And in case you don't know where Corning is, um, it's about 60 miles south of Rochester. So it is in upstate New York. It's in the beautiful Finger Lakes region of the state. Totally different world than New York City. So when I say I'm from New York, everyone just assumes I'm from New York City. Uh, I am not. Anytime I go to New York City, my goal is to get out uh, as quickly That's, as I can. I hear that so much. <laughs> so, yes. <clears throat> my wife, um, before she met me, she went out and like a... She just wanted to take a drive, I guess. I don't know. Um, and she said she got into New York and instead of going shopping and, and all this, she said that she, we live in um, the beginning of the Appalachian Mountains. So mm -hmm. that is not a city place. Uh, yeah. It is not a fast place. It is a very welcoming um, small yes. town, um, mm -hmm. like where you say you're from. Yeah, so that's kind of the um, the end of the Appalachian Mountains is in that area. So it kind of oh, stretches, wow. stretches northeast. We've got the hills there. And then if you go a little bit beyond that, it becomes flatter and you get to like Lake Ontario area. And then, of course, there's the Catskills and there's the Adirondacks. But um, yeah, we are kind of on the outskirts, kind of the, the outer edge of, of Then you know exactly how I live. Uh, yeah. Lots of hills, lots of hollers, oh, yeah. lots of creeks. Yeah little yep. lakes uh lots that's of what it is here too in state college so we've we've got uh well, big bigger hills here compared to where i'm from in upstate new york but it's i'm in ohio by the way yes yes uh, uh, of course john knew that <laughs> chill coffee right yeah chill coffee man you've done your research yeah. that is wonderful <laughs> um so wonderful questions i don't know if i've had uh this many wonderful chatters i guess you would say commenters um it's been really fun. Um, the science fiction is fantasy with technology and a place of magic. I love that about what we do. Yeah. Jules Verne wrote fantastic dreams of the world that just hasn't been invented yet. Yeah, very well said. I have to do my research on Jules Verne. I hope I'm saying that right. Yes, yeah. And and it's all about imagination, right? So, so you know, whether you're within the context of fantasy or within the context of science fiction, you're trying to go beyond what we can do right now in this physical world, whether it's with technology or, or magic, you know, we're, we're trying to envision what it is beyond what we have now. And in many cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially on the science fiction side, that can actually be really inspirational for, you know, scientists to make yeah. real scientific ad advances uh mark says john and i know a yeah. guy who wrote a book based on chill coffee right so i mentioned him and yes you did our, that was like, you wasn't it the yeah, semi that was me. so yes. joshua shu great guy um so he's a medical doctor and he's also an, an author and he wrote a book called in a hotel room in chill coffee uh, he he lives in Ohio too. He's um, I think in the northwestern part of the state. Um, yes. And uh, yeah, he published this book in indie. It's an indie kind of. It's part horror, part sci-fi. It starts off very much a horror book, ends up in kind of the the sci-fi horror domain. Um, it's it's fairly short. It's accessible and it's a lot of fun and it's got some uh, really nice psychological depth to it too. So um yes there is there is a, a really great book that is in your hometown the only book that i know of that is based in or where my hometown up here is my hometown of hornell new york hornell with an h every time i say that people say oh i know cornell you cornell? Know no it's not cornell it's hornell um <laughs> with an h um so f scott fitzgerald's uh, book tender is the night um you know it's a it's about you know this doctor who basically gets further and further into a life of misery and at the very end of tender is the night the very last paragraph um the main character ends up spending the last years of his miserable existence in a small town called hornell new york <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful. That, is, that is my hometown's claim to literary thing thank you well f got yeah i was gonna say that he is not a small unknown name so, in a way, he, he pays homage, right? Well, I, I, while Mark's on here, I, I also wanted to say um, one of my favorite things so far in interviewing indie authors is hearing about your wonderful blog off. 
the SPFBO was something I wasn't familiar with. And I've become not only acquainted with it, but it's brought so many um, meaningful people to my life. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted and to know that. That's just, I mean, what a wonderful way to give back to the community. I mean, Mark has created something there that, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it has highlighted hundreds of different books and authors and just created a whole community around this competition. And I know what he's done there is it's um, brilliant and uh, just a great service to everyone here. Yeah, hundred percent. If I talk too much about the wonderful people, you made me see a grown man cry. <laughs> um, so I, I know you read in the, you read a lot of tra traditional published authors, i.e. the wonderful Mark Lawrence. Yes. Um, do you have any other hobbies that, other than what you're doing at the wonderful Penn State University um, or your blogging? Sure. sure. Places to grant in the Rimdark Magazine and before we, oh, wow, I, bleh, before we go blog. <laughs> All right. So I also love to cook. And I think this is something that's pretty common in material scientists that, you know, we're all about getting the right ingredients, making it go through the right process to produce yes. something. And, Processors and, are so fun. Yeah. And with cooking, it's like the same thing, but you get to eat it at the end. So I love to cook. Um, be back before the pandemic, I, I used to uh, travel the world quite a bit too. Um, so I guess travel could have, could be listed as a hobby, not so much anymore, but one of the, the things that I like most about travel is getting to sample the different international cuisines and then trying to bring back some of that and try to recreate some of the flavors at home. So I love cooking. I love international cuisine. Actually, two of my bookshelves at home are nothing but cookbooks and everything is arranged west to east. So it's like, oh, gosh. where, where do you feel like eating from? <laughs> today like thailand or france or greece or that's Colombia fun or something and it's just it's it's great i love it i wish i had more time to to cook um but uh yeah it's it, and you know a cookbook a cookbook is the gift that gives back like you oh it sure is and you know you've got great meals coming for for years to come so cooking is is a big hobby i also love the outdoors um i especially love kayaking and in the summertime, um, going up to the Finger Lakes region of New York, and I'll, I get up at absurdly early hours of the day. Um, <laughs> so part of it is to exercise, part of it is to read, part of it is maybe to catch up on some work that I'm behind on. Um, but when I'm, um, you know, during the summer at uh, up in the Finger Lakes, I will get up actually, you know, before dawn and just set out in my kayak and go into i especially love the the channel areas that connect the lakes and there's just so much natural beauty there and uh, i love to try to, to spot all the different wildlife all the different birds we can see john um, you've inspired me to do a couple of different things <laughs> to absolutely start buying cook books because I, I would be lying if i said that i'm in the cookbook section at the bookstore um very often but what i've found through talking to you uh, is with four young children. How fun could that be? Oh yeah, and if you uh, you know if you expose them to different types of cuisine, then um, you know the chances are they're gonna like a broader variety of food. So like you're not cooking mac and cheese every meal, for example. And, yes. Uh, oh my gosh, that hit home really hard. <laughs> uh, oh, and on this topic too, indie cookbooks are a thing. So just wow. like you've got indie in the fantasy community and sci-fi and so on. Indie cookbooks are a thing too. And one of my favorite cookbooks is a Thai cookbook that is an indie published cookbook by um, uh, Vata Baker is her name. It's actually by two authors. The one I remember right now is Vata Baker, V-A-T-T-A, -T -T Baker. Um, I think it's called Thai Home Cooking. And I've used that book so much that the pages are just falling out of the spine. It, it's so good. So if, if you're into indie and you're into food, be sure to check out the indie cookbook scene as well. Um, what was the name of the female that you just said? Uh, Vata, V-A-T-T-A. Uh-huh. Yep. Okay. Baker. Yep. Baker. Yep. B-A-K-E-R. Correct. Yep. I'll have to check that out. All right. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if this question is for you. I'm sure it is. Um, I'm still reading uh, Return to a Dan, which if you, sorry, sometimes, there we go. 
um, he is very much into it. And as I know you are. Oh, that's uh, awesome. <laughs> have just you had, with each book. <laughs> he says, uh, have you had any video conversations with Philip about the book? He's dealing with some very important issues. Yes. So we, uh, I'm scheduled to have a video discussion with Philip um, about the book on October 21st. And uh, Mark Lawrence is going to be a part of that discussion too. And I think Philip has uh, a third guest who's going to join us as well. So um, yeah, Mark Lawrence and I and Philip and probably one other person too, October 21st, we're going to have a live October discussion about, about the trilogy. So I'm so excited about that. Philip Chase is amazing, by the way. He's, uh, I was on his Dear Doctor Fantasy back a couple months ago. And um, oh, so much knowledge and so much passion um, and just love of sharing that. And we got to talk a lot about teaching too, since we're both professors, albeit in different fields. Um, but there's you know a lot of common um, common like uh, struggles for, from a teaching perspective and uh, also you know ideas for improved pedagogy and it was just such a great discussion with him and he, he's just an awesome person. And if Matt Matt if you're asking me, which I, I know you're not, but I'm going to answer this anyway because I can't wait to speak with him. Uh, Philip knows I want to speak with him, so we will. I hope to schedule something soon. Because what you're about to do on the 21st, I have to be there and be in the chat. That's going to be so fun, man. I'm looking forward yeah. to that so yeah. much. Oh, and that book, you know, you can, or that whole trilogy, you can tell that he has spent, you know, 18 years on this and he has just polished it to perfection. I mean, it's, it's a labor of love. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's so detail oriented that he just, he just nailed it across the board. If I, yeah, it, it I love watching his videos, especially, uh, and he's very active on like Twitter and stuff like that too. Uh, and he's all inclusive. He's a very, he's a, he is a gentleman. That's what I was getting to. Oh, Philip yeah. is the gentleman of fantasy book too. Can't wait to read his books. Andrew, I totally agree with you. What a yeah. wonderful guy. And it and, was so cool getting to go on his dear Dr. Fantasy because I've been watching his YouTube um, videos for even before I started reviewing anything. I, I just, I always loved his videos. And when we got to, you know, have that live conversation and I'm like, oh no, the, the YouTube guys is talking at me. He's talking at <laughs> me. Yeah. And now I need to respond. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny when you talk to people um, that you look up to uh, your own little heroes. And it's even better when the don't meet your hero thing is scratched mm -hmm. out, you know? You prove that wrong yeah uh because i think you should beat your heroes you just have to know which ones to meet and which ones not yeah to meet. And he is yeah. every bit the gentleman behind the scenes that he appears to be he's just a, a very genuine person i i believe he just got back from uh was it nepal nepal right yes yeah. how fun would that be wow yeah I, that's and one thing i haven't gotten to do in nepal too his his background, you you can tell he's not in New Jersey anymore with <laughs> the background from Nepal. Is that where he's at? Is New Jersey? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely a little bit of a change. Yes. Uh, of scenery there, but w what a wonderful um, contrast when he did get mm -hmm. to Nepal. Like, oh, mm -hmm. you know. Um. <clears throat> so yeah, just I, I I don't know of anybody who couldn't keep continuing to say more and more wonderful things about Philip Chase. He's doing, yeah. and what he's doing for the indie genre or the indie, you know, the indie yes. realm. Yeah, and he has joined as one of the judges for SPFPO too, and he's taking out a full set of 30 on his own. Uh, yeah, of course yeah. he is. Yeah, and like, he, come on. Uh, yeah, there's already been two two videos where he's named two semifinalists. One, one of them I've already read by uh, Material Faywood. The other one I, I'm looking forward to, to reading too. That's the um, uh, Bob the Wizard by uh, Matt Prindle. And I, I'm just, yeah, I'm excited to read that one too. And he's got, I think. MV Prindle, right? MV yeah. Prindle? He yeah. uh, sent me that. And why didn't he mention to me that he knew he was semifinalist? He like I had this was on my radar a few months ago. Bob okay, the Wizard, so this is a rel relatively new announcement. I think Philip announced this maybe one to two weeks ago, something like that. Yeah, he. Uh, I have to look it up. Anyway, it's it's on my TBR, and with a name like Bob the Wizard that cusses, smokes cigarettes, and, and you know how could that not be fun? Um, <laughs> Garden Gnome says, 
he's a he's a busy guy. Are you talking about Philip um, or Jot? Because well, either either one would work. Um, gosh, this has been so fun. What is next for you? What is next for me? Yep. Oh my goodness. So do you mean like professionally or book wise or? Well, yeah. So I'll I'll reiterate. What is what is next for you? Um, I guess, is there anything special coming up as far as your blogs? Uh, one of them, obviously, oh. is October 21st. Um, something okay. like that. So, okay. This is new news. So, um, the coolest thing that's going to come out from Grim Dark Magazine um, coming soon is um, a live, or not live, but a, a video interview with Patrick Rothfuss. So, oh, wow. um, and this was, this was insane. Um, so Beth Tabler was able to set this up. Um, part of the interview is going to be in the next issue of the magazine, the next issue of Grimdark Magazine, which, which will be published in about a week or less than a week, October 1st or shortly thereafter. So you'll get to read part of the transcript of the interview there. Um, but yeah, we got to talk live with Patrick Rothfuss and the conversation lasted over three hours. Wow. Uh, he has not done an interview in quite a while. At yeah. Um, and he's got a new novella that is coming out, uh, The Narrow Road Between <laughs> Cage Fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I agree, John. Next up, John Morrow's Cage Fighting. <laughs> career. What yeah. doesn't he do? Yeah. Wow, that is so exciting, Patrick Roth. Is and, um, yeah, he does. And that's the other thing. I had to like pinch myself, and it took me like twenty four hours to calm down after this interview. Like during the whole thing, I was like, "Is this actually happening?" Like yeah. Patrick Roth is is there, and and I just had to focus on, okay, can I can I articulate my words and make them come out in some coherent way for Patrick <laughs> Roth to respond to? You're um, pretty good at that. <laughs> he um. I mean, obviously, he's been, you know, one of my heroes of fantasy ever since *The Name of the Wind*, which is just, just a gorgeous book. Um, and of course, he's had, um, you know, he's been very public about it, his, his mental health struggles in yeah. uh, recent times. And we got to talk to him about so many things over the course of three hours, including um, a, lot, a lot of the mental health issues. And he was very raw and honest about things. And um, and I just, I, I, at the end of that interview, it just reinforced with me, not only what a brilliant author he is, but just a wonderful human being that that man mm -hmm. is. And he is somebody who has an excess of empathy. He's like, he's so caring and he wants to give back and he wants to do more for charity. And, but he's also such a perfectionist that he's never happy with what he's able to achieve. And um, and it's, it's just just a great guy and a wonderful once in a lifetime opportunity that I'm never going to forget. And I think this is a very sincere question from John, um, and I think that anybody who doesn't know this does need to know. Yes, he's um, well. Answer that, John. What do you think? Is he typically seen as inaccessible? I think he's become a lot more inaccessible because of um, you know, kind of the, the pressures that he's facing with respect to um, the third book the trilogy. And like, there's a whole community out there that's like, where is it? Where is it? And and honestly, a lot of fans are, are being um, very harsh with him. Bullies. Um, yeah. They're, you they're can't bullies. bully an adult. And let me tell you, yeah. it's it's absolutely just as mean as an adult. Yeah. And he, um, and honestly, he is his own biggest critic too, because he is such a perfectionist. Um, and you know, at the very end of our conversation, I, I actually, I, I kind of, I took the opportunity to try to give him some personal encouragement and a bit of a pep talk too, about how all of the great things that he's already done, you know, with his charity and with the books he's published and all the millions of lives that he has touched. And, um, you know, I'm also a perfectionist. I, I, it, it's, it's a double um edged sword right there's there's good things about it there's good things of setting high standards for oneself and it's got to be exhausting and, though right but yeah there's the other side of it with yeah it is exhausting and if you set impossibly high standards for yourself then um you can end up doing more harm than good and uh, he gave a, a really detailed response of, about that and so many other things so um, you know, look for this coming out in um, Grimdark Magazine, both 
part of it in the print issue that comes out in October. And then we're going to have some videos coming out on the Grimdark Magazine channel. Basically, we, we need to see, because I don't think anybody wants to see like more than three hours all at once, but we're going to break it up into more digestible chunks for people to watch. But, you know, that was amazing. Wow. I'm so glad you talked about that. That is exciting. Um, I can't wait to, I can tell that it a, was a touching emotional situation yeah. for you and him and, and anybody else involved. Uh, so you've got October, October 21st with Mark Lawrence. Yep. And Philip Chase. Chase. Yeah. And potentially somebody else uh, that's going to be so exciting. I can't wait <clears throat> for that. Um, I will be looking for this interview because I think I can learn a lot from it about him. Mm -hmm. um, and wow, thank you so much. This has been one of the most interesting and knowledge finding, uh, knowledgeable episodes that I've done. And uh, I really hope that this isn't the last time we talk. Uh, well, thanks, Matt. It's, it's, it's my pleasure. <laughs> And um, yeah, it, it, I will absolutely hit you up very, very soon for another talk because this was fun. I can't wait to learn more about you and what you're doing, read more of your reviews, more of your uh, recommendations in which it's a pretty heavy sheet over here of notes that I've written down. <laughs> um, and, and that's what I expected. So thank you so much. And thank you. Is uh, I always like to ask, um, my interviewee, if, is there anything else? I, I think you kind of probably did that. But if there's anything else uh, before we head off that you'd like to say to either the people who joined or about oh, yes. you or say, say thank you for um, for everyone who who joined. And, you know, thanks for all the great friendships that have formed um, together here. It's, you know, being a part of this community has has really opened up a new world for me and, and um, you know, helped me to pursue one of my other passions beyond my uh, official professional career. And it's, you know, all the friends, all the, the great books and great discussions. I, I just, I can't thank you all enough. And it's, it's truly, um, you know, my honor to be a part of this community and to, um, you know, be able to hopefully do a little bit to help and um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's that's such awesome. Pleasure. Thank you for that. That, that's, mm -hmm. that was heartfelt. Uh, and I have to say, as, and I know I haven't been in, in the realm this very, very long, but, uh, I don't so, see myself leaving. Um, yeah. it's been encouraging, inviting, inspirational, knowledgeable, insightful. Uh, and I can't wait to just continue that and also continue with see what you're doing and everybody else I talk to. So, once again, thank you. I feel very honored that you stopped to spend a little time with me and for the people who stopped by to, to chat and see while we were live and for those in the future. Um, any links that we discovered, so like, or dis discussed, uh, such as Grimdark Magazine, um, Before We Go Blog, um, Mark Lawrence, I'll, I'll make sure to put his, he stopped by and he's doing the SPFBO, stuff like that that we discussed during this live in the description. Um, but until next time, guys, just uh, stay inspired and be safe. And thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Take care.